Uh, there's also colony level traits because as many people know, uh, you can't just look at the bee, you have to look at the colony. It's a super organism. Uh, it's kind of like a city. How, you, know, you can't just look at how an individual survives a sickness, but how the city survives a sickness. All right, uh, so I will just start. Uh, my name is Nicholas Scarmella. I'm a PhD student here in Sweden. I'm originally from the United States, from California, uh, but I'm in my third year of my PhD project studying honeybees. Uh, I'm at uh, the Swedish University of Agricultural Science, which is SLU for short because of Swedish translation. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about a paper that I published, uh, which is going to be discussing the brood adaptations uh, to resist varroa destructor parasita parasitization in European honeybees. Uh, I'm going to skip completely over the beginning of my presentation, which is like how bees work and how what the varroa mites are and all that, because I'm assuming you all know that. So I have deleted that entirely. We're going to jump directly into the project. Uh, an important thing with my project looking at this infestation is looking at the individual and colony level traits for how these uh, bees resist infestation. So we'll start with the individual level traits, which is how an individual itself is defense defending against varroa. So this can be done with developmental timing. So for example, if a pupae hatches or emerges faster, the varroa will have less time to reproduce. There is also physiology. So this could be the bee itself resisting viruses that the varroa is transmitting. It can be hormones, which we're going to get into. This is kind of the, the crux of my presentation, so we'll get into that. And then also genetics, which is something that I'm going to be looking at in the future. I don't have any information about that now, but that's kind of the future of my research. So I don't talk about it now, but it is something that I'm going to be looking at later. Uh, there's also colony level traits, because as many people know, uh, you can't just look at the bee, you have to look at the colony. It's a super organism. Uh, it's kind of like a city. How you, know, you can't just look at how an individual survives a sickness, but how the city survives a sickness. Uh, so you can look at hygienic behavior, which is how the bees are clean, clean each other. You can look at specifically varroa sensitive hygiene, which is how the bees are cleaning each other in direct response to varroa. As well as recapping behavior, which is when the bees will uncap capped pupae, investigate them, clean them out, possibly kill them if they're sick. Uh, and that could be a way to lower mite levels as well. Uh, this second section here, the colony level traits, are the ones that have gotten most of the research in the past. Uh, a lot of the behavioral things, if you guys know about the um, uh, Baton Rouge research with the Russian bees, that kind of stuff, that's all about varroa sensitive hygiene, cleaning behavior, that kind of stuff. Um, like I said, I'm specifically looking at individual level traits. And one reason for that is Behavior is very complex and hard to breed. Uh, so what I am trying to find is something that is a little bit easier, hopefully, hopefully, uh, to breed into bee populations or select for in the future. That's you know kind of the the shoot for the moon thing. Eventually, we're definitely not there yet, but that's that's the idea for the project. Uh, with these traits. Um, we want to see bees that naturally have developed these. So this is kind of an older map. This is from 2016. But this just shows you some of the populations around the world that have been shown to be resistant to Varroa. Uh, so you can see there's the Arnott Forest in New York. Uh, there's the Russian bees, which I talked about earlier, which they've moved, they transported a whole bunch to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to do research. Um, I'm personally working with the Gotland bees in Sweden, which are in the middle top. Uh, and I also uh, am working with the Avignon bees from France. Um, I'll talk about them a little bit here, but not, not too much. I'm mostly working with the Gotland bees. Uh, 
uh, with these Gotlandies, so just to start, Gotland is an island just off of Sweden. It's in the Baltic Sea. Uh, and my population was started, as you see, at the very southern tip of Sweden by this man. Uh, his name is Ingmar Fries. Uh, he started, let's see, uh, yes, it was established in 1999 at the very southern tip of Gotland. Uh, they started out with 150 hives. And after three years, over 80% of all those colonies died. Uh, what was left over, though, became the basis of this Gotland population. It's actually been nicknamed the Bond Project or the Bond Hives because they were left to live and let die. Uh, and yet, yeah, surviving colonies are the basis of our research. Oh, these project these colonies were then phenotyped in 2011 by my uh, supervisor, Barbara Locke. Uh, so she went in and tried to find what are these bees doing? How are they alive still? Uh, and they were found that they have, in general, compared to non-resistant hives, smaller colonies, much less likely to swarm. They're more tolerant to viruses. There are no adult behavioral traits for role, for role removal. So all of those colony level traits with cleaning, hygiene, whatnot, they have none of those. Uh, but more importantly, they found that they reduce the my reproductive success. So what that means is the amount of uh, offspring that the varroa females laid was less compared to a non-reproductive or a non-resistant uh, population. Uh, they also found that these traits were heritable, so you can breed for them. So there's a genetic basis for this, which is very exciting. But then what I step in is I'm doing, I looked at an excluder experiment. So we collected data in 2017 and 2019. We used multiple colonies from different resistant populations. So I talked about France and Gotland. We have those resistant populations. There's also one uh, up in Norway uh, that we use. So we have three different resistant colonies. And we compared those to a non-resistant Swedish colony. So it's a different colony from in Sweden, but is not resistant to Faroa and needs the general treatment that all the other bees, bees need. Uh, we placed excluders over half of the brood frame to prevent adult access. So you can see we uh, did two different types. They were trying to see which one they liked better, uh, a metal frame and a nylon frame. And basically you now have all the ones that are inside of these uh, meshes or cages, the adults are not able to access. So those brood are developing without any interference from adults. We then looked at how many, how many um, successful reproductive events happened with the Varroa. So we went in and counted every um, adult female that emerged. With this, what we wanted to ask was, do the adult worker bees have a significant effect on mite reproductive success in our three resistant populations? And we hypothesized that if the higher rate of failed mite reproduction that is found in our resistant population is due to brood effects, then when adults are prevented from interacting with the capped brood, there should be no significant difference between mite reproductive success. So basically, if adults if, if adults are important, then we should see a difference when they're there. That kind of boils it down. And, which is really excellent, it's exactly what we found. So if you look at this graph, we have it broken up between our different populations, so Sweden, France, Norway, and our Swedish control. Uh, and then those are broken up into those where the adults are able to access, which is the exposed, and those where the adults are excluded, which is the excluded. And you can see there is no difference in our population between our excluded and our exposed. So if we look at Sweden, which is our Gotland population, they're both, the Varroa mites inside of there are basically reproducing the same number of offspring, whether the adults are present or not. So this tells us that the adults are not affecting this reproduction. It is the the brood then that should be affecting it so then that gives us uh evidence and kind of fuel to move forward to look at what is it that the brood are doing how are they able to lower the reproductive success when it's not the adults which have been the historically researched part another thing that we looked at kind of like a side thing but just kind of interesting is we also looked at the reason why a failed reproduction happened so this is, you know, kind of a lot of data, but basically I, I wanted to throw this in there because we want, it's very common to want to look for like one answer and say, oh, well, you know, if we can increase the number of infertile females, 
or if we have, we have a population that increases for, for infertile females, that's going to solve it. We can breed for that. But we see in these three different populations, there are different levels. France and Sweden are kind of similar, but especially if you look at Norway versus Sweden, uh, these are natu naturally resistant populations. So they've kind of reached their way of resistance through different routes. So it's also important to remember that these microcosms are unique and it's important to kind of treat them as such. There's no one answer that's going to solve everything. We kind of need to treat our individual regions specially. So uh, in Michigan, for example, you guys might need to come up with a different answer than what they do in California, things like that. Um, yeah, this was just a little interesting thing. I want to throw that in there. But yeah, so this was the main re uh, results of my experiment. Uh, it gave us a lot of evidence to move forward, trying to find out what it is the brood are doing. Uh, and just real quick, I want to some acknowledgements because you have to do acknowledgements. Uh, I have three supervisors, so Barbara Locke, Joachim Rodriguez, and Robert Glenwood. Uh, so thank you to them. I have some collaborators who are helping me, such as Yannick Gallagher and Isa Gulunle. Uh, the European Research Council, which has given me all the money that I need for this project. So it's wonderful that I can not worry about that. Uh, the B group here at SLU. Of course, all of you for listening. Uh, I hope that wasn't too quick. And now uh, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. And just like that, it was over. <laughs> hope I didn't talk too fast. I know I have that problem. No, you did just fine. So um, having having gone over the the, the paperwork uh, or the, the, pub, the publication, um, I did have some questions that had come up and uh, some that immediately come to mind is some of the stories in the background of the Gotland population, you know, when yes. it first uh, was established. Um, and some 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 folks have, you know, um, made reference to them as, as being a sorry bunch of bees. Um, but it doesn't yes. necessarily <laughs> seem uh, seem as like that's that's really the case. I, I think it would be more along the lines of what is the comparison and contrast like. Um, how do we define their status? So um, you'd mentioned that they are smaller um, yes. and that they have a lower propensity to swarm. Yes. Um, I have always theorized or hypothesized that, you know, with it being a fairly close population, there's probably mm -hmm. some implications with the genetic diversity playing a role. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But what I mean, so what is the current, you know, health and status of the Gotland population? Uh, so... They are alive. They're 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 doing relatively well. Um, we actually in 2017, I want to say, don't quote me on that. They had a quite a hard year. Um, they they dwindled down. Uh, quite a few of the hives actually uh, uh, didn't make it through the winter and whatnot. From that, we've slowly been building them back up. Like you said, with the genetics, we don't want to create this kind of inbreeding depression where we take one hive and then explode them and then everything has the same uh, genetics. Uh, so we've kind of slowly been building them back up. One of the reasons, though, they have been called some, a sorry bunch of uh, bees is they are not good at the moment. They are not good for honey production. No honey producer is going to want these bees. Uh, they produce enough to survive which is, you know, step number one. But we like, we've gotten questions before saying, oh, when are you going to sell your queens? When are, you know, why, why can't we get these genetics into other bees? You don't want these genetics as a bee producer. Um, as far, if we're talking more of like, uh, kind of the basis where we can slowly start breeding them out, kind of selecting for more uh, favorable honey traits, that would be great eventually. But at the moment, they're surviving. They are, I would say they're not thriving as far as humans want them to. Right. That right. They, yeah. So they have some, they have some characteristics that we would tend to find favorable when dealing with a pest like Varroa. However, yes. they're not necessarily going to meet the needs that we have as beekeepers. Exactly. Um, where it comes to um, the ability to reproduce and to um, utilize them for production purposes. Yeah. yeah this kind of goes also along with like the Avignon bees in France. They, they produce more honey. They're, they're a little bit more not sustainable. That's not the word I want to use a little bit more desirable. The problem is they're very mean. <laughs> they, they're, you know, you want to breed for very gentle, docile bees. If you can help it, they are very, very aggressive. So you can have these other random traits pop up that we don't want as beekeepers that, you know, it's kind of the trade off and then you have to figure out how to deal with that. So. Okay. 
Um, so what, when you, when you, when you're, when the population is being evaluated or maybe in mm -hmm. your own evaluations, what particular viruses was the population being assessed for resistance to? Uh, yeah, so that was not part of that project, but the big one they were looking at was deformed wing virus. Um, specifically with Varroa, deformed wing virus is the big, uh, weapon uh that's the one that you see skyrocket there's some other ones um uh, i believe a q per i'm not sure exactly what you guys have in michigan i know here for example like acute b paralysis virus is uh can be transferred at lower levels in the the mite um oh, there's a couple other that are escaping me right now but the big one is the they, they virus. Run the, yeah they run the gamut here um yeah do do you recall if there was a higher prevalence of a versus b um, as far as their ability to resist, are they doing better with one over the other or both? Not sure. A versus of um, DWV. D of DWV. I don't have that in front of me now, but of A versus B. Uh, that, that has been published, though. That data is out there. So I can definitely send that to you or look it up and let you know. Um, I, I'm, I There's a virologist in our group. That's uh, Joaquin Rodriguez. He's the one that takes care of all that. that uh, I'm working more with um, chemical stuff so I, I don't know so much about the viruses myself unfortunately yeah so um another question that comes up mm -hmm. is the adult behaviors how you were qualifying mm -hmm. what it was being observed during the exclusion experiment so mm -hmm. um what adult behaviors would you say could be defined as this is what we would say is an adult behavior that kind of lends toward a resistant type behavior especially as it falls in the category of hygienic behavior yeah, so w this would not be with RBs because we did not find this, but other people, for example, like uh, the, no the Norwegian population, they have a very high prevalence of recapping. So that would be the adults go in, remove the brood cap, either investigate the bee, uh, the brood itself, the they might kill the brood if it's too sick, uh, and that has been found. It hasn't been directly tied to lower reproductive success, but... It has been found you have these resistant populations, they greatly increase recapping. They're trying to figure out how to, the, the Norway uh, researchers are trying to connect those two, which they haven't done yet. But that's one example of it. Uh, another thing is the varroa sensitive hygiene, which can be the adults that clean each other more aggressively. So the uh, when the mite is not in with the brood, it is uh, on the adult bee, on the, on the body. Uh, and they're very good at hiding on the adult. But if you have these bees that are much more uh, hygienic, they will do a more detailed clean. And in that clean, they will then remove the uh, the varroa that are hiding on the bee. Mm -hmm. Does oh, that make so sense? Yeah, yeah, kind of what you're describing is uh, the, the mite biters. Uh, yes, the exactly. Groom, the grooming. Yeah, versus yes. the varroa, the VSH, where we, we, we think that that primarily interacting with the brood in some capacity. Uh, is VSH not included the mite biters? Uh, I, I think they fall in the same kind of realm as like okay. hygienic behavior, but the mm -hmm. VSH function is more along the lines of what we feel like a, a uncap recap or mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're going into the brood and, and, and this is what brings some interest to your, your publication. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what exactly about the brood is signaling this response to the adults to engage with the pupa or the varroa in the cell and what yes. those particular functions are. So, um, you know, if, if they are eliciting some sort of a hormone, um, yes. and I think you touched briefly on that, maybe you could elaborate. What is it? What is that signal that's occurring uh, from the yeah. brood that's triggering that that BSH response? Yes, uh, that's actually, so not necessarily VS, VSH, but brood chemical signaling is actually the next step in my experiment. So I'm writing a paper on that right now. I can't really talk about the results too much because it's not published, finalized, all that. But uh, there is an ongoing nonstop communication between the brood and the nurse bees. They are, the brood are producing these different hormones that the nurse bees can smell through the capping and then know, 
oh, the B, uh, the pupae is this age, it is healthy, it is not healthy, you know, whatnot. Or I don't know what it is. This is a weird signal. I need to go investigate it. Uh, and you can quantify those chemicals. Or we, we know what those some of those chemicals are. Like it's, a, it's very complex, but we know what some of them. So for example, there's one um, methylenoliate. You can take a spray bottle, not literally, but a spray bottle of methylenoliate, spray it, and then the bees will then all go and investigate and be like, oh, we need to uncap this and see what's going on. Um, so the exact cocktail that the brood are producing in order to be investigated for varroa sensitive hygiene. That, as far as I know, we don't know the exact cocktail that they are producing because different populations can produce different ratios. You know, this one produces 3% methylenoliate versus this one, which produces 8%, you know, um, because it, it is different between populations. Um, but there are these different profiles that they're using to communicate which is also how the mite knows when it needs to reproduce, when it needs to jump in there and start feeding and whatnot, because they intercept that. Um, uh, and that is what the adult bees are using to know like, oh, I need to investigate and this, there's a mite in here or something is sick or something wrong is going on. Did that answer your question? I feel like I meandered there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it kind of goes, it, well, it, yeah, I mean, as is with all of these things, a lot of it can be speculative versus factual, and, you know, mm -hmm. that's what triggers our investigation into these matters, so we can better, you know, understand and apply the science yes. to our, our practical beekeeping. Um, so the other question that I kind of lens from that, I'm sure mm -hmm. you're familiar with Dr. Kara Wagner's work, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, there was some observations of cross fostering between the adults and the uh, uh, the the brood, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, I believe that publication was twenty. I want to say twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, somewhere around there. It's I want to say it's twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, as far as the cross fostering is concerned, you know, what are your thoughts on how the how the hygiene and brood function interact? Um, and did have you have have you observed any of the cross fostering during the exclusion experiments? Uh, no, we but our exclusion experiment was quite passive. We didn't actually look at adult behavior in terms of what they were doing. So what we did is we we set up those meshes, those cages, put them in the hive, and walked away. We then came back before the brood emerged and counted the uh, mites reproduction. Um, there's actually a really interesting a paper just came out in from France, uh, Dr. Freddie Jean Richard, uh, they've set up a thing they call it a dance, dance hive, I want to say, but it's this really interesting setup where you can record the bees and how they interact and she, they do it specifically for dancing, but you could definitely apply it for how the adults are interacting with the brood and without any disturbance with, you know, long-term studies, and you can see exactly what they're doing. So I don't have too much research or too much experience myself on this stuff, but it's definitely something that going forward uh, is very interesting, can definitely be looked at. Um, there's a lot of grounds for that because like I said, I'm specifically looking at the chemical ecology, but that's just because that's what we found with our bees. That's not, that's saying, you know, all bees are gonna have, this is the way, you know, behavior is not the way to go. No, like that's just what we found with ours. So we're moving forward with that. But there's definitely lots of ground for different behavioral hygienic work uh, in other labs and other populations. So it's safe to say that your observations indicate that there's some sort of a brood function that's inhibiting the mite reproduction in the cells that you observed outside of the caged population. So the adults did not influence the behavior of the brood as it interacted with the fertile mites. Yes, yeah. Um, you, you have to be a little bit cautious with how direct, how like 100% you're saying like, oh yeah, adults don't matter anymore because, you know, it could have been no <laughs> Well, they do, yeah. Like, they, they still yeah, matter, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it specifically with uh, reducing the mite reproductive success, they yeah, the adults definitely matter. Um, but yeah, our results are showing that it is something with, that the brood are doing because we didn't see any difference between whether the adults were there or not. So this lowered reproduction then logically should have to be from the brood. Um, right, and right. like I said, I'm, I'm doing some chemical analysis to try to see if there's a difference in the brood signaling between our resistant population and a non-resistant population. And we are finding some 
good results. Like, like I said, I can't go into f total detail, but it does seem like there are differences in how the brood are communicating with the adults, which then will enter, will can mess up how the mite is intercepting those, that signal, that information. Yeah. Um, so as far as typical mite fecundity is concerned and the mm -hmm. infertility rate that exists in general in the population, there's mm -hmm. a, there's always term, like it's tossed around 10%, 15%, 20%. I think generally we'll say in conversation, 15% of most Varroa are going to be infertile. And during sure. your observations mm -hmm. of the fecundity in the, in the exclude of uh, the non-excluded uh, brood, mm -hmm. did you find that there, like, were you factoring this into your evaluation uh, as far as the reproduction was concerned that 15% of them probably are infertile? Yeah. So if we look at, if you assume 15% are going to be infertile, uh, I know that slide was up there for not very long, but if you look at the results we got, our Sweden population had around 50, only 50% of them were fertile. Uh, re I should say reproduced successfully, excuse me. Um, okay. So even considering that 15%, that's still a quite a large jump or drop, excuse me. Uh, let's see. And then our, yeah, our Sweden population, I'd say was around 45, 48%. The French population was maybe 52 and the Norwegian population was around 75. So even if we assume the 15%, we still do have a drop. And more importantly, we didn't see the difference between the two. That was kind of our big thing was looking at, uh, because yeah, our control was around, yeah, I want to say that one's probably around 85, 90% successful reproduction, which kind of goes along with that 15% uh, naturally infertile. All right. Then when you were using the term heredity, <clears throat> then mm -hmm. you were finding that the resistance was found in the population that you're studying. Mm -hmm. How do you define mm -hmm. heredity? Yeah, so th that was an experiment that was done by my my supervisor. Uh, if you take a Bond queen and mate her with a, uh, sorry, a Gotland resistant queen and mate her with a non-resistant drone, the offspring, that high will still be resistant. And vice versa, if you take a resistant drone and mate her with mate him with a non-resistant queen, that hive will also be resistant. Uh, they these same traits that you see in the like resistant resistant cross is seen in the non-resistant resistant cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if we were to just kind of in a word summarize the 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 paper and reference mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and and we all know that it, the the catchphrase is further research is necessary right <laughs> yes um, always the study basically suggests that host resistance traits of the honeybee brood can suppress mite reproductive success independent of adult workers doesn't mean that it's exclusively the the, the primary function it just says this is one of indeed the primary functions that are at work when it comes to the mite reproductive success mm -hmm. And if we combine that with some sort of other high level function of hygienic behavior, some, some, mm -hmm. somewhat like Dr. Martin's been working on as he's observed this in resistant populations in your uh, map you referenced earlier, mm -hmm. um, that it's pr pretty a pretty good one-two punch. Yeah, absolutely. So the like that the title of the paper is very specific because we we nothing in our paper said that there is no adult worker reproduction or uh, no adult worker influence, uh, influence mm -hmm. going on. We said in this, the, in this scenario, the adults were not, uh, did not affect it. Now, whether our bees do some low level of varroa sensitive hygiene, which they've developed since that paper in 2011, because bees are always changing, they, they adapt so quickly. Uh, that's totally possible. Or you could maybe find a way to breed a population that has these brood traits and an adult trait. And that would be like, fantastic. That would be the best thing you could get. Because then you're getting, yeah, like you said, one, two punch tackling it from both sides. Um, but yeah, our paper was just trying to see if in our population was this happening and it seemed like the adults were not, it was happening independent of adults so like i guess we kind of had to uh be delicate with our wording it's happening to some extent in both facets so you're seeing it in both the adult and the brood populations they're working in tandem to reduce this pest influence 
Yeah, yeah, in, in different populations. In our population, we, we're hopefully this year actually going to be phenotyping them again, redoing that project from 2011 to see <laughs> if there's still no adult traits because, you know, they can always develop over time. Um, so, yeah, but different populations, definitely you have the adult workers uh, attacking the Varroa and in our population, you have the brood attacking the Varroa, so... Now, have you guys evaluated the population in tandem with the without the exclusion of the adults and and, and looked at the the percent change in reproductive success based on that? Um, you know, as a comparison. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, have you evaluated the reproductive success of the mites or the varroa mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. without excluding the adults to compare the percentage in which they would be successful? Yeah, that, that was the other, because we have those cages, but then we also pulled the exact same, uh, the number of pupae from outside of and those control. cages. Yes. Well, in, in both, the, we yeah, we did the control outside of the cage. So then we know that when the adults were there, like, there was a 49% uh, mite reproduction, and when the adults weren't there, it was a 48% mite reproduction. So, so no change. No, yeah, no difference. And they were both resistant populations. Yeah, it was the exact same frame from the hive. We split a hive yeah. in half, looked at with and without adults. Um, so yeah. there should be no difference between queen. Well, we had multiple hives. We you know we did statistics to combine hives together, but there should be no difference in season, no difference in hive location. It should have been all nice and neat and pretty. Hmm. Very good. Well, we're glad that you did the work and uh, enjoyed the Thank you so publication much. and. Glad that there's more on the horizon. What's uh, what's the next big step for you as you move forward? Yeah, the next, so the paper I'm working on right now is, like I said, looking at the actual chemical compounds that these mites, uh, these pupae are producing over time. So I'm looking once they're capped, so the capping is their zero hour. I look at them every six hours and try to see the changes in their uh, chemical profile that they're producing and how that differs in our resistant population versus non-resistant. Uh, we got some, like I said, tentative, but good results there. And then after that, the goal, the, the, the golden egg, as it would, is to try to find a genetic component for that. So we want to see what genetically is causing these differences, because then maybe you can breed that into populations, select it, uh, get a breeding program going on. You know, that will, the breeding program is after my time. I, my PhD is not long enough to do that, but I would like to get this started and then pass it on to someone else or maybe as a postdoc or future researcher or whatnot. But yeah, so chemicals what are you and to then do genetics. Once you get postdoc? Oh, well, that depends on where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, right, you, right. you know, you can you can say I want to keep working on the Gotland population, but if there's not a, a grant call funding you, you got to you got to move a little bit over. But I'm right. I'm hoping to be able to keep going with this, try to see what the bees are doing, kind of maybe eventually lead to a breeding program but that's like i said that's that's shooting for the stars so off off topic in a sense mm -hmm. do all, do the, do do the swedes um shop at ikea oh yeah absolutely especially so i'm in uppsala which is a university town so it's a lot of students and every apartment you've been into is just full of ikea it's uh wow. it's everything yeah it's interesting uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, we, uh, there's one in town. I've been there many times. You can get some Swedish meatballs. They're about the same as you get in Ikea in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, probably healthier, maybe, because there's, I don't know, maybe, well, maybe they're the same ones. They say they're the same I, ones. Yeah, they taste the same. So it, yeah, if they're out of yeah. stuff, it doesn't change the flavor. That's right. That's right. Well, good. Thank you so much for um, uh, doing this today. appreciate it. Yeah, thank we you for having finally me. Connect. Yeah, um, sorry it if, took so long. <laughs> that's all right. If you would do me a favor and like send me like a brief like bio, if you have one for you that yeah. I can add as a bit of a you know a presentation piece with the with the talk, and we'll combine it with our meeting, and um, the the folks can watch it and we could discuss. Yeah, and any questions shoot my way. You have my email. Yeah. Um, yep. And yeah, I'm. This has been great. Thank oh, you so much. You, uh, I appreciate. Yeah, I was hoping who you got out what you were hoping for with it. Oh yeah, we just you know I what I like to do is we like to explore the papers and then like mm -hmm. you know take take the take the information and see how it's practically applicable. Um, kind of raise the bar, if you will, when it comes to like beekeeping education. You know, because absolutely, here, that's great. You know, yeah, 
we have a lot of information when beekeepers come into the trade, if you will, mm -hmm. treat, 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 treat. And, you know, treating is an essential aspect of beekeeping. But at the same time, if all the education is only focused on that, we never learn any more about heredity or genetic diversity or breeding. Um, and it's just like just more of the same. Uh, the population itself is going to adapt regardless of us. And the more that we utilize them as an agricultural livestock, the more that we're going to reduce their capacity for adaptation because we're constantly selecting for what favors us. Um, Absolutely. Which is what makes Gotland so fascinating. Like, you know, the, the bees uh, as a species are doing what is necessary for them, not for us. And that makes us determine them to be unsuccessful, but really they're, they're just fine. As far as nature is mm -hmm. concerned, they're doing what is necessary for them to feed themselves through winter and get on with it. Um, yeah. Versus us, yeah. we want to make a hundred pounds off of each colony so we can yeah. sell it. <laughs> exactly. It's interesting. You were talking about treating them more as a livestock, basically uh, in Sweden. I don't know the exact date, but I want to say maybe 20 years ago, uh, they were actually treated as plants. So as far as uh, laws and lawmakers and whatnot were concerned, they were just thrown in with plants. And then it just finally became a thing like, oh, no, they're animals that we need to, you know, actually take care of and think about. And now there's kind of more of a push to get them treated like livestock. Um, I'm at SLU at the University of Agriculture. I'm in the um ecology research center but my supervisor for example kind of wants to get us pushed over in the veterinary center because like you know these are livestock why aren't we treating them yeah obviously not biologically but why aren't we treating them more like cows and chickens you know we are mass producing them we are domesticating them that kind of stuff why are they not treated more along the, those lines so it's just an interesting uh phil philosophical debate about how you look it at is it. Yeah. Yeah. And the more naturally minded folks will say like, you know, <laughs> they're livestock, livestock to the extent that they decide to stay, but at any given moment they could decide to leave. And, uh, you know, and I think that's what kind of creates that crux between are they livestock or are they wild? Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they can leave whenever they want. And in, and to some extent they can survive without us if they do leave, but a majority of stocks, especially in the U S probably won't survive. I think greater yeah. than 50% of them will perish, but that's also nationally or internationally. The attrition rate for honeybees is about 50%. Seems like it's, yeah. it's a species relative kind of situation. Like it doesn't matter what we're doing. Only half of them live and that's part of their paradigm. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. I, I know that like natural beekeeping is a pretty hot topic. Um, yep. Here they, people get really passionate one way or the other about it. Um, so that, that's something that always, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly like where you guys stand on natural beekeeping, so we won't get into it too much. But I know you, you definitely, you know, you don't want to create mite bomb, disease bombs at the same time if you don't do anything sure. and then they they spread. Um, so that that's kind of the the crux. You want, you know, you do want we want them to naturally adapt, but we don't want to, you know, because we don't keep them in natural settings. Apiaries are not natural, so then no. it's kind of the the play but the play between. Yeah, we promote we promote monitoring and selection, and um, mm -hmm. we defer to cultural mechanisms first. If you you know if you get to a point where the cultural and um, you know mechanisms are not sufficient, or maybe mm -hmm. the time of the season is too late to get on, you can't do something as simple as requeen or a brood break. Yeah, because um, winter is yeah. at your doorstep. You may have to intervene in a uh, you know uh, invasive way with chemicals, but yeah. principally speaking, the education starts with the cultural means first instead of the yes. chemicals. We defer first to the mechanical, second and last to the chemical. We yeah. actually teach the pyramid, if you will, for the hmm. IPM. So mm -hmm. nice, and yeah, I mean that's still intervention. So requeening, brood breaks, whatnot. It's not just kind of like oh they'll figure it out and then they die because <laughs> you know. Yeah, if this I had a thousand my... colonies, that might work because eventually yeah, I'm get with, with 10 out of nice. a thousand. Yeah. 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 And then there's the whole ethical thing is it, is it okay to let them die when basically they're dealing with what we've introduced them to? You know, the mite is here because of us. So, but that, that yeah. goes into a whole, whole thing. Yeah. We, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I like them because they make honey and I can make money off the honey and then I can raise queens and I enjoy queens. So, yeah, there's a there's a dilemma. It's a catch 22. You're introducing 
your habits and desires into a, like the Gotlin bees. They don't need you, but if you mm -hmm. are making them dependent on you, there's there's some sort. There's got to be a trade. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. All right. Nick, uh, is it Nick? Is it yeah. go by Nick? Is okay. Yeah. Right, I mean, Nicholas sure. is fine, but Nick is easier. So. Well, Nicholas, I appreciate you very much. Thanks for coming on.